Yesterday I recorded an interview with Bridget Chappelle here in the 3CR studio and Bridget is a Melbourne-based activist with a particular interest in the Middle East and is also an award-winning maker of zines. She's spent a fair bit of time campaigning in the Middle East in recent years and she's written about her latest experiences in a wonderful and a beautifully written zine called All My Friends Are Mountains. It's a 44-page zine and it talks about lots of things like the environmental destruction of the Iraq war, the aftermath of Saddam, the aid industry, the anti deutsches crusade in the Middle East, sex work and the female prison system in Iraq and Kurdistan, the Kurdish Spring, underground media in Kurdistan, the Kurdish Anarchist Forum, as well as animal rights, wildlife trade and hunting in Iraq, and anti-speciesism. Welcome to the studio, Bridget. I was just wondering if you can start by telling us about the meaning of your uh, zine, All My Friends Are Mountains. Where did that title come from? It actually comes from an old saying that the Kurds have no friends but the mountains. The zine is about uh, time that I spent in Iraqi Kurdistan last year. Um, it's a very mountainous region. Um, it's crossed by two mountain ranges. And the Kurds have been really hard done by uh, just about every other group of people living around them uh, and colonial empires. So, yeah, this old phrase, the Kurds have no friends but the mountains, kind of just carried over into the title of my zine. How did you end up working in Kurdistan? Look, I was pretty interested in the region in general. Um, I had recently just before that, uh, spent nine months in Palestine. It had piqued my interest in a lot of issues surrounding the area. Um, but I was really, really interested in uh, working for this one particular environmental organisation in Kurdistan called Nature Iraq. It's the only environmental organisation in the country um, and I was able to take an internship there. Um, I was interested in a lot of other issues in Kurdistan. It's a really, really interesting region. Uh, issues to do with like human rights and uh, independent media, uh, the prison system. Um, it's got an interesting area for how would I even put it? Like human geography. So it's a it's kind of a key point on a refugee route through to Europe. I don't know. There was a whole host of issues there, but I was interested in investigating. And you mentioned a, an organisation that you interned with. Nature Iraq, who are they and what do they do? What's their mandate or their mission? Um, Nature Iraq is primarily a scientific environmental organisation. It was created in 2003, just after the start of the war, by a group of Iraqi scientists and conservationists who had previously been trying to do similar work on a more informal basis under Saddam, but finding it quite difficult. There was a really interesting vacuum created in 2003 when suddenly there are a lot of foreign powers coming into Iraq and a lot of them were quite interested in building up an NGO sector. Not for completely honourable reasons, obviously it was tied into uh, making contacts to exploit the resources in Iraq and that kind of thing um, and just kind of putting a more positive face on that. So one of the organisations to be born out of that situation was Nature Iraq actually one of its principal sponsors was and still is the Italian government. And it's not because Berlusconi had some, you know, deep-seated love for the oh, really? Iraqi <laughs> environment. I know, surely I jest. <laughs> um, no, it was just because, yeah, like every other European power, they were interested in making oil contacts and this was a convenient way to go about doing it. But the upshot was that uh, a group of Iraqi conservationists suddenly got a huge wad of cash to create this organisation with. And since then, they've been involved in a lot of really interesting and important projects. So there's an interesting dichotomy between who's funding them, uh, which is pretty nefarious, and what they're actually doing on the ground, which is pretty amazing. One of the principal projects that Nature Iraq has been involved in is the replenishing of the Mesopotamian marshlands, which is the largest wetland ecosystem in Western Eurasia. And people started draining these marshlands uh, in maybe like the 1950s, um, reclaiming land for agriculture and also for oil exploration. But things really came to a head in the 1980s and 1990s when Saddam just drained them exponentially and created this huge internal refugee population of the marsh Arabs, which are an indigenous group of people who have been living sustainably off the marshes for several thousand years. 
essentially since the beginning of the cradle of civilization. Yeah, yeah. The marshlands are also really significant for a lot of wildlife. It's a major stop-off point for a lot of bird migration routes and that kind of thing. So the draining of the marshes under Saddam was catastrophic for both people and other animals. But Nature Iraq was involved in replenishing the marshlands through building a canal from the Tigris River to kind of reroute a lot of the water to, wow, that's, that's to like, sounds the like, marshlands. That's a massive engineering project. Yeah, yeah, it was huge. But the upshot of it is that, that now uh, the marshlands are being replenished, a lot of the marsh Arabs are starting to come back, a lot of the birds are starting to come back, and the ecosystem's coming back to life. So, yeah, it's a good example of good things that you can do on the ground with bad money. Um, <laughs> yeah, also they're just really strongly focused on building up a body of baseline data about Iraqi flora and fauna. So there's a lot of... That was lacking? Yeah, seriously lacking. Yeah, there was no government money given to that kind of environmental research under Saddam. And also, yeah, there just really wasn't too much of a capacity for it. What purpose does that serve? Well, I mean, I think aside from just, you know, for the sake of having that information, one of the interesting... Uh, ramifications would be that then you know you have more information about population numbers of different animals in Iraq um, many of which we know are endangered but we just don't have the hard numbers on how many species have how many individual animals left. When you were going to Kurdistan you would have been telling people that you know you're going to Kurdistan to work on animal and environmental issues what kind of reception do you get from people when you're telling them that in a period of massive social upheaval in the Middle East, you, you must have got some strange responses. Yeah, really, kind of, yeah. I, I thought they were pretty strange, but I can kind of understand where people are coming from. A lot of people would say, surely that's not a priority right now, to go to Iraqi Kurdistan to work on environmental issues. And I kind of, I don't know, the, the whole experience taught me that really the reverse is opposite. It's the most marginalised and disenfranchised people who are generally the most dependent on their local environment. When you have less material resources, you're more likely to go hunting and fishing and, you know, depend on your local environment for subsistence and that kind of thing. So it's quite often those people who are the most acutely aware of the impact of humans on the environment. And certainly the, the, this, this is true in Iraq. Um, prior to the invasion of Iraq in 2003, um, one of the UN weapons inspectors, Hans Blix, actually said he thought that the environmental impact of the war was going to be far more devastating than any of the human impacts. And it, it, it's completely true. And it's the fact that the environmental impacts are in turn impacting on human humans' quality of life as well. So I think it's one of the absolutely central issues to what's what's going on there. Right. Do you have language ability uh, some sort of fluency in the local languages? Um, I speak Arabic. I don't speak any of the Kurdish languages. There's a small cluster of languages which we can just, you know, use Kurdish as an umbrella term for. I didn't have enough time to learn Kurdish properly. And it was really kind of uh, not a faux pas to speak Arabic with Kurdish people, but I would never walk in assuming that they wanted to speak Arabic because Kurdistan is essentially a country that has no... You know, it doesn't exist as a nation state. Um, the Kurdish people are one of the largest ethnic groups that don't have their own state. And they're kind of spread out, maybe like 20 or 25 million people are spread out through Iraq, Iran, Syria, Turkey and Armenia and Azerbaijan. And so they're split up between all these different countries. And, you know, in Turkey, they have to learn Turkish. In Syria and Iraq, they have to learn to speak Arabic. In Iran, they have to speak Farsi. So it's, you know, got this, speaking one of those languages kind of has the connotation of speaking the language of the occupier. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you could do it as a pragmatic thing, but you'd never do it as a kind of, you know, <laughs> you wouldn't you speak Arabic to ingratiate yourself. With yeah, sure, <laughs> sure. You're active in the anarchist scene. Tell me how animal rights sits within the anarchist worldview and within your own worldview. I suppose it really depends which branch of anarchism we're talking about. I'm pretty interested in green anarchism um so i think that's a really big part of that um and i also identify as a non-violent anarchist um and i don't think that yeah i think violence is one of the most direct forms of power you can hold over someone 
or, or something. So I want to reject that. I should also say, though, that I don't, while I myself identify as a nonviolent anarchist, I would never expect somebody else to do the same thing. Um, Eamon Hennessy has a really interesting saying about, uh, he, he was a white American uh, Catholic anarchist, actually, and he said he was, was born into the world with a whole arsenal of privilege. You know, he's white, he's male, he's, you know, living in an incredibly wealthy country, um, and he felt that he kind of already had an, almost an obligation to be nonviolent because he has so much, you know, violent potential yeah. <laughs> by virtue of his privilege. Yeah. And I kind of feel like, I, yeah, I, I feel very privileged and I'm quite comfortable being nonviolent, but I would never expect anyone else to, you know, take up a similar stance. Sure. Now we'll return to the interview I recorded yesterday with Bridget Chappelle. Bridget's an animal activist, among other things, and is speaking about the illegal wildlife trade in Iraq. There's been kind of expressions of interest uh, in recent years for the government to focus on taking care of its environment. A couple of years ago, the government of Iraq signed on to the Ramsar Wetlands Convention, which is a international convention for the for the protection and conservation of wetland ecosystems and that was really promising because it means that the government is interested in addressing this issue so what we're hoping now is that the government will sign on to the CITES convention which is the convention on international tra trafficking <laughs> oh i've got it i've got it written What's down here it's the convention on international trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. Right, exactly. That Thank one. you. <laughs> it's a bit of a mouthful. It is a mouthful. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise known as CITES. Yeah, so, and the government has expressed some interest in signing on to this convention, um, which would potentially, yeah, it would have ramifications for the issue of animal trade and trafficking and hunting in Iraq. Can you give us an idea of what the status of, anim of the animal trafficking trade is in, in Iraq and, and Kurdistan? Look, Iraq is, um, it's essentially become this kind of hub, a regional hub for animal trafficking and trade, simply because, you know, it's got very porous borders. Most of the laws are very badly enforced if they exist at all. So it's become quite a useful area for regional animal traffickers to simply work out of. And there is definitely an internal market for, for wild animal trade in Iraq as well. There's always been, I mean, in, in, in recent history of Iraq, there's been a kind of culture of uh, acquiring wild animals as a status symbol. If you're, say you're a rich businessman or you're a government official or something, I suppose it's the same as buying a Merc or a Ferrari to park outside your villa. You could also, why not acquire an African lion to, why not? Put, to put in the garden of your <laughs> villa? And then as soon as they become too large to take care of, just, you know, get rid of them and, and start again. So, as in, kill them. Yeah, kill them and start again. Yeah, get a, so get a soft, cuddly one again. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's a really big class issue as well. I have to say because it's, you know, rich businessmen, government officials, people who have actually stood to gain something from the invasion, who have managed to claw their way up, yeah. or you know, remain atop of the situation. While it's the people who are, you know, rural or poor or you know, disenfranchised who are usually involved actually in the trafficking or the hunting, bringing the animals to the rich guys to buy the animals. So in your zine, you described what you saw at the zoos and in the markets. And I, I was quite affected by those descriptions. Can you share with us what you saw? Yeah, it's pretty horrific. So like in, in pretty much every city in Iraq, there'll be kind of an animal marketplace, which is partly for people to go and buy, you know, like you know, animals that they're just going to cook and eat, like chickens and that kind of stuff. Um, and then there's also, you know, attached to the same marketplace, there's wild animals to be sold for these kinds of purposes. So, yeah, to pe for people to take home as, you know, pets. Also to be used in traditional medicine, there's also a kind of market for that. And then beyond that, you also have places which we'll call zoos, for lack of a better word, <laughs> because people will go to them as zoos. They'll, you know, take their family to go and... It's a day out. Yeah, exactly. Like, the, some of them, they're actually in these kind of little fun fair situations, which is just really surreal. But they'll be very, very small cages with, a, you know, just stacked next to each other, full of wild animals, just brought from all over. The, the zoo in Sulemania, which was the city that I was based in, um, 
There were brown bears, uh, goited gazelles, quite a few birds of prey, and also a couple of African lions. Yeah, like a lot of animals that have been smuggled in from other parts of the world and animals that have been also caught from different parts of Iraq and brought there. And then also just alongside them, there were just domestic animals, so like cats and dogs and that kind of thing. But they were all held in really shocking conditions. I've never seen anything like it before. It took me months to stop having dreams about what I saw in these places. And it is really surreal, the fact that it was partly, you know, take your family out for the day to look at these animals, knowing that at the same time, every animal there was for sale for the right price. So it's not necessarily a zoo as we understand it. It's more like a a trading hub. Right, exactly. Yeah, it was almost as though... The, the zoo aspect of it was just a, you know, an, an, a convenient way of making some extra money on right. the side and it lent it an air of legitimacy. It kind of took some of, I suppose for some people, it takes kind of some of the sinister feeling away from it. Sure. I mean, for example, uh, like an African lion cub there would have gone for about $80,000, whereas a lot of the local animals would have sold for maybe a couple of hundred each. And then down to the, there's a big market for... For birds, there's a big culture of falconry in Iraq. Um, so there are a lot of yeah, birds of prey that would be caught in Iraq and sold there and also sold to like Kuwait and a lot of the Gulf states and then a lot of waterfowl that have ca- been caught from the Mesopotamian marshes, actually. They would sell for about $20 each. I understand that Australia has been implicated in some of the trade it of has. wildlife. Does that mean that Australia is actually breaking international law, seeing it is a signatory to the CITES convention? Look, I don't actually know what the law is on that because it's coming from a country that's not a signatory. And there is actually no law at all in Iraq about the trade of wild animals. There is one very small, low level, I don't, it's not even a law, it's kind of an act that's just been introduced by the Ministry of Environment in Kurdistan. So in the Kurdish region of Iraq, the Northern Autonomous region of Kurdistan, Uh, there are very small restrictions on bringing in certain types of animals, taking out certain types of animals and hunting certain types of animals. It's not enforced. And in the south of Iraq, there's nothing like that at all. Right. Um, But the principal trading partner is actually Switzerland, the USA, Kuwait, um, and a lot of European, other, other European countries. So the Netherlands, Norway, the UK, France, Sweden, all of these countries... Um, there's many documented cases of the animals being taken there for sale from Iraq. But it seemed to be that the standard kind of um, trafficking route for a lot of the more, uh, like the, the exotic animals, for lack of a better word. So, you know, the ones that would fetch a really high price, like tigers and lions. Yeah, they'd be brought originally from Africa via Thailand. Uh, and then generally they've been transported to Syria and then brought in to Iraq from Syria through, you know, unguarded borders. But it really makes the mind boggle. Like, think of that. Think of that route that these animals have taken in tiny wooden boxes, maybe with a couple of, you know, air holes knocked in the top. So why is it that that Iraq, most of its neighbours are signatories to the CITES Convention? Why is Iraq not? Look, I think it's probably just a case that, I mean, the Ministry of Environment is... It's only existed as an entity in Iraq since 2003. And the only reason why the Ministry of Environment exists is because it was essentially just one of the conditions placed on the new, like the new government when the Americans invaded. They said, look, we've got all these great ideas for you about how you're going to set up your new government. You know, you're going to have a market economy and you're going to do this with your government. And one of the conditions was that you need to have a Ministry of Environment. And it was essentially just kind of a hodgepodge that was thrown together full of people that were fired from other departments and then just kind of amassed in this new Ministry of Environment. Yeah, so it doesn't bode well. No, it's it's a Ministry of Environment in name only. And right. I, I don't have enough information about all of the wheelings and dealings and the inner workings of the ministry, but I think it's fairly safe to say that um, a lot of the people in it are not environmentalists and it's it's really an amazing feat that even the Ramsar Convention was signed and it's only thanks to the work of lobby groups like Nature Iraq. So after being in Iraq and, you know, seeing what was going on, 
with animal trade and trafficking close up. One of the things that it really made me think a lot about afterwards was, um, you know, what, what's the best way to address this is issue? It's so huge and it encompasses so many other issues, like it touches on the geopolitics of the area, the poorest borders, the poverty. Incredibly complex situation. Absolutely. Coming from an animal rights background, you know, and I completely believe that, you know, what we need is empty cages, not larger cages. But thinking through, you know, all the steps that you would need to go through to improve the lives of the animals already being held in Iraq and to try and stem the flow of more animals being brought into Iraq. It's actually really hard to go in there with this complete abolitionist point of view, going, look, what we need to do is, you know, just get this, you know, little group of vigilantes and are going to go in and liberate the animals. Like, with bolt cutters. Yeah, I mean, and like, I don't think that I didn't think about it because I thought about it every day that I was there, yeah. you know, but... Like the, the the nearest animal sanctuary would have been thousands of kilometers away in Istanbul or something, and like the <laughs> the practicalities of it were just mind boggling. And not to suggest for a second that there are not people in Iraq who feel the same horror as I did, because there are. But you know that there was no group that I knew of who who would do that. Um, and once you liberate the animals, as you suggested in your zine, once you liberate them. They'll just be replaced. Right, exactly. Yeah, so I, it was really interesting for maybe the first time in my life to start considering these really, really kind of reformist approaches. Like actually probably the first best thing to do is to get more funding to increase the capacity of the zoos, get the zookeepers, so-called zookeepers, trained up so they actually know how to take care of the animals, they know how to recognise illnesses, you know, and just bring a whole lot of regulation into the whole thing. So, okay, it's not going to stop overnight, but maybe there'll be less animals and they'll be better taken care of. And maybe you just need to be really damn utilitarian about it <laughs> if you want to get anything done. And it's heartbreaking to have to think in that way, where all you're trying to do is minimise the damage. You have to accept that a terrible amount of damage is going to keep happening, but you're just going to decrease it a little bit. There was a part in your zine, All My Friends Are Mountains, that I found really interesting and I just wanted to, you to expand on this and I'll just quote you. I've heard and read certain things from some animal rights activists over the years that have baffled and horrified me by their barely concealed racism and I'm pretty conscious of the fact that in being a white animal rights activist writing about the animal trade in Iraq could in some minds already place me in those ranks. I also want to avoid a reductionist conclusion to all this and not just say that anyone who cares about political issues outside their home is an effing colonialist. That's really interesting that, that you see a lot of racism in white animal rights activists. Can you expand on that? Look, I mean, I think we all need to be really, really conscious of, you know, our own positions and our own backgrounds when we're going to do political work anywhere, you know, whether it's in our backyard or in a completely different place. But I feel like it's really easy as a Western animal rights activist to get locked into this idea that, you know, all of our assumptions about animal rights and the best way to, you know, live those in our daily lives is, is the only truth. And I think it's also really easy to kind of, you know, just take snippets of these horrific things that we can see happening in other parts of the world, whether we're talking about, you know, certain things that might be done in Chinese medicine or particular hunting practices uh, in different parts of the world and go, oh, you know, look at this. And when are they going to get up to this point where, you know, they realise that this is actually just abusive or something? I don't know. I feel like it just lends itself to a lot of sugar-coated racist ideas. Um, I mean, the most obvious example is, um, what's that guy from... Um, the Smiths, um, Morrissey. Morrissey, yeah. <laughs> I kind of, I think of him as being like the kind of embodiment of all of this, you know. Um, I think, you know, he seems to just kind of like caught in controversy anyway. But he'll say things like, you know, Chinese people are lesser humans because of what they do to, you know, animals in the, you know, in their traditional medicine practices, or you know, they eat dogs, or yeah, the hypocrisy is quite astonishing. Yeah, yeah, indeed. You also also write about the Quran, how the Quran preaches a message of compassion to animals. So what's happened to this teaching in 
in modern Islam? Has it gone the same way as the Christian Bible's teachings of compassion to animals? Yeah, I mean, I suppose I wanted to mention it. Just, I mean, not even to kind of um, levitate one particular, you know, religious philosophy over another or anything like that. I just wanted to kind of provide this reference point saying, look, there are actually a whole bunch of passages in the Quran and the Sunnahs about compassion to animals. Um, I'm definitely not an expert on any religion. I've just, you know, found these in readings and stuff. And there actually are a lot of really interesting interpretations of what the Quran has to say about animal rights. There's a really interesting movement in Sufism, like Sufi Islam around vegetarianism. Like vegetarianism has been an interesting point in Sufism for hundreds of years, actually. And there's quite a few blogs out there about Muslim vegetarianism and animal rights and that kind of thing. I mean, and you find similar movements within Christianity and Judaism and stuff. So it's definitely there. But I don't think that it really... I think if we're talking about the way that animals are treated in, yeah, say, say in Iraq, I don't think it's any reflection on religion at all. I really think that religion is just a reflection of the society that practices it. <laughs> so back to the final stage of the interview with Bridget Chappelle activist and award-winning zinester. So you've written a number of zines, seven or eight zines. Can you explain some more about the zine culture? It's, it's a mysterious little underground culture that I find <laughs> fascinating. Can you explain more about that and, and, and how does it lend itself to activism? Sure. Yeah, it is pretty underground and mysterious, but <laughs> that's probably why I like it. I don't know. I Yeah, I've written quite a few zines and most of them have been kind of me unpacking things that I've done as an activist. So I wrote a couple of zines about my time in Palestine as well. I think one of the things that really appeals to me about zines is I feel like they are innately anti-capitalist. Um, I really like the fact that, you know, I can go to a zine fair and I don't have to take money with me because I can actually just trade in zines. And I think the fact that they're meant to be, you know, produced on, you know, a small print run and people put a lot of love into their creation. I don't know, you really come to treasure them in a way that I, I don't treasure, you know, like articles that I might read on the internet or articles I'd read in a newspaper or something. And I think that they do a really good job of intertwining the personal and the polit political. Obviously, zines mean really, really different things to different people. But Australia does have a really interesting and vibrant zine scene. Everything from, you know, like art zines and indie zines and per zines to explicitly political zines too. I found your zine to be beautifully written. Oh, thank you. And it was, <laughs> yeah, it was not the kind of writing that, that I'd read elsewhere, that it was, there was something uniquely zinish about your yeah. about your writing. It was very, I've... very... I don't know, I got a real sense of who you are through reading your zine. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I put a lot of myself into my zines, almost to the point where I feel a bit awkward giving them to people I don't know very well because <laughs> I poured so much of myself into them. Yeah. Well, maybe it'd be good for you to actually explain what a zine is and what what defines a zine. Sure. Well, I guess you could call a zine, you know, they usually look like small booklets generally. And they've been, you know, either made by one person or a group of people and they're self-produced. So there's a really strong component of like DIY, DIY ethic and culture in making zines and then just kind of stapled together and distributed. Uh, people might give them away for free. They might sell them for a dollar or two. People usually only do a print run of like, you know, anywhere between like one and a couple of hundred. But the idea is just, you know, to have kind of a, an un, an unfiltered, you know, stream of of creativity running through the zine that's not edited, it's not held back by any kind of, you know, I don't know, expectations or standards or, you know, funding worries or that kind of thing. But yeah, I mean, so people will make zines about anything from, you know, like what they're pet cat did yesterday <laughs> to, you know, yeah, like a trip that they took to Iraqi Kurdistan. <laughs> Do zines get used much in, in the activist scene? Do they serve as a as a useful vehicle for activism? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think probably more so now. To be honest, like political zines are being more and more replaced by blogs and social media and that kind of thing. 
because it is just, you know, a much more instant way of connecting everyone with what's going on. But there's definitely still a smaller core of people who would use it for that kind of thing. The recent anarchist fair at the Abbotsford Convent, that was full of zines. There were mm. so many zines there. Yeah. I, was, I was drowning in zines. Yeah, that was really exciting. The anarchist <laughs> book fair was fantastic. There were so many zines. <laughs> so are there any zine-making resources out there for the for the would-be zine star? I think the website zinelibrary.info is really, really, really useful. It's just like this huge kind of archive of um, like zines in PDF form that people have, you know, like uploaded themselves and then it's ready for people to download and print off themselves. So some of my favourite zines I've actually just gotten off zinelibrary.info and started copying them myself. There's kind of a big disparity in the zine community between either like anti-copyright or cop copy left or creative commons, that kind of philosophy versus copyright. I mean, there actually is like a smaller minority of zinesters who are really into copywriting their zines, which I think is a bit weird. It seems to be not in the zine spirit. Not at all. I, I, I feel like the whole, I mean, like some of my zines I don't even own copies of, you know, like you put them out into the ether and then they're gone and it's fine. <laughs> um, but zinelibrary.info is a really, really, really nice resource. So you can find a lot of really interesting both political and personal zines on there. Also, if you're in Melbourne, Sticky Institute in the Flinders Street subway. That's just an entire shop front just purely devoted to zines. Um, As in selling selling zines or supporting the um, zine makers? Both, yeah. Okay. So you can come in and sell your zines. But we also just do a lot of events like zine launches and we have a zine fair once a year and like, I don't know, drawing groups. If anyone ever wants to come and get involved in the space, all they have to do is turn up. Tell yeah. me about your zine, Veganistan. Okay, so Veganistan is a zine that I made last year. And it's funny because when I made it, I thought maybe, you know, a, a handful of friends and family would politely buy it to be nice to me. <laughs> um, but it's it's been really, really, really popular. So it's a collection of vegan recipes from the Middle East and the Maghreb, which is North Africa. Just recipes that I've collected from travels, basically, and friends and you know, people would often ask me, you know, oh, you spent a lot of time in the Middle East. Is it hard being vegan there? And I'd always, you know, really enthusiastically go, no, it was amazing. <laughs> I ate so well. I put on 10 kilos when I lived in Palestine. I just ate so well. <laughs> and I just really wanted to share that with people. And the zine is raising money for Vafa, which is a dog shelter in Iran. It's uh, one of the few dog shelters in Iran. And I think it's a really, really important project to support because... It's actually illegal to own a dog in Iran. Sorry, it's illegal? It's illegal, wow. yeah. Yeah, it's just a, a strange law that's been brought in by the government because I, I don't think there's like a kind of a huge traditional culture of um, having dogs around in, in Iran. And it's been linked to this kind of strange idea of, you know, uh, Western decadence to own a dog. So it comes from this strange, you know, political slash puritanical perspective. But what it means is that there's groups of hired goons by the government going around just rounding up dogs, kind of like the pound would here, but then just exterminating them. And there's this amazing woman, Fatima Mutamedi, who has just kind of taken it upon herself to try and rescue as many of the dogs as possible. So it's just based outside of Tehran and... Yeah, she just goes around picking up hundreds of dogs and taking them back to her shelter outside the city. And that's what I'm supporting. And not only that, but Veganistan has won uh, a zine award. Just yeah. recently, you've been um, awarded the Golden Stapler 2012 <laughs> yeah. award, which is great. Yeah, that was from the Adelaide Zine Fair. It won second prize at the Christchurch Zine Fair last year, but the only thing that I got for that was some guy's Hawaiian shirt. So, And I understand there's uh, volume two in the works yeah, of Veganistan. Yeah, yeah, it's going to come out this summer and we're going to have uh, a launch for it, hopefully, to raise a lot more money for Vafa. So... Feel free to keep your ear to the ground about that. If you want to get a copy, you can get it through uh, World Vegan Day, which is happening on the 11th of November. Um, and we've also got copies at Sticky. Yeah, we'll be selling them at the Freedom of Species stall at World Vegan Day on the 11th of the 11th at Princess Park in Carlton. So come along and get a copy of Veganistan. And we'll also be selling All My Friends Are Mountains. I just want to leave you with something from your zine all my friends are mountains and it was just a final piece it was just a really constructive summary of what we can do mm. about 
the situation. Address animal exploitation in your backyard. Reject the curation and commodification of animals and boycott zoos and aquariums. Find a local no-kill animal shelter and offer to volunteer your time. Find an animal rescue liberation group in your city or start one. Go vegan. Call animals he, she or they, not it. Talk to your neighbour who never takes their dog for a walk. Offer to walk their dog or go with them together. Don't support animal husbandry. Encourage friends to take home a companion animal from a shelter, not a breeder. Savour the beauty and honour of sighting animals in the wild, an equal exchange in which they have chosen to show themselves to you. Tell us how we could get involved with Nature Iraq to help out. How would we go about it? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, Nature Iraq takes volunteers and interns. I mean, it's not hugely geared towards that, but if you want to go and do an internship with them, say, for a couple of months or even longer, they'd love to have you. You don't need to have... Uh, a science background although it is helpful yeah you might do field trips uh, you might do you know less glamorous uh, editing and report writing kind of work but which is equally important it's super important yeah and I mean and if you end up working on the animal trade issue then you might have to do some field trips to the zoos but they also take uh, interns on a remote basis so even if you just want to help with editing kind of stuff Um, oh you mean so you could you could work anywhere in the world yeah it's certainly worth getting in touch with them so it's naturearc.org and you can just find the email address on there too easy my back to the mountains and heading west again unseen fingers slowly smoothing the jagged crags out into gentle waves teeny tiny villages barely distinguishable from the ochre hills poke faces out me cows are mingling on the side of the road kurdistan has broken too many bits of my brain conceivable or otherwise The universe, in her infinite wisdom, however, decided to plant a small boy holding a pet monkey on a chain on the side of the road as we finally coasted out of the infernal border crossing. My head caved in as I pasted my face to the glass. I dreamt of animal cages and bolt cutters last night. Thanks so much for coming into the studio. That was awesome to talk to you, and we look forward to seeing you at World Vegan Day. Yeah, I can't wait. (laughs) See you then. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. That was our interview with Bridget Chappelle, recorded yesterday. Uh, Bridget is an activist extraordinaire. And now we just have um, some community announcements. 